Okay. Um, the next agenda is a agenda item that was actually mentioned to the Board of Selectmen last week in our first meeting, post-town meeting. The town manager mentioned that there had been a correspondence from uh, the MBTA through uh, one of their contractors about three monopoles is what they call them. Uh, one at uh, 49 Haverhill Street, one at 2 Burnham Road, and one at 326 Ballardvale Street. So it was going to be on tonight's agenda. The decision was made to let all the abutters know in advance, I'd say, to make sure that there wasn't a conversation that didn't happen with the abutters here. So I know that I fielded several calls over the weekend from people to say, geez, I just found out about this. Well, we just found out about it as well, and I want to thank the town manager for being proactive uh, to do that. So that's why you received something probably Thursday or Friday for tonight's meeting. So that, that's the glide path we're on. So um, we're here tonight to really get educated on what the proposal is, what this project is, what it entails, what are the next steps, what are the voices we have, what are the voices you have in this project. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our assistant town manager, or uh, yes. our town manager. Uh, no, um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Deputy Manager Mangiarati has been uh, managing this since we received formal notification on May 3rd. Um, and at this point, uh, if I may, I'll turn it over to him. Thank you. Uh, so the proposed uh, monopoles that are listed on the agenda are part of an MBAT, MBTA project being managed by InMotion Wireless uh, to provide Wi-Fi to commuter trains uh, throughout the state. Uh, the town was notified about these monopoles on, on the 3rd of May um, by Ramaker and Associates, <coughs> a firm out of Wisconsin. Uh, they're serving as a consultant for uh, InMotion Wireless. Under federal requirements of Section 106, uh, Ramaker requested comment from the town and the public regarding any cultural or historic properties that may be impacted by the proposed monopoles. It's important to clarify that the, the T is not making a presentation tonight and they're not seeking approval for these proposed monopoles and there are not any local permitting or approval processes underway related to, these pro to this project. Uh, the purpose of this item tonight on the agenda is to notify you all and the public about the current opportunity that we have or you all have uh, as part of the 106 process to provide comments uh, regarding the historical and cultural impacts to your neighborhoods. Uh, it's not clear what additional opportunities for comments that we have, so we wanted to make sure that you are all aware of this opportunity. Uh, since, since we received the notice, we had various meetings internally with staff. We, we conferred with our legal counsel. We spoke with other communities uh, that have received similar notices uh, from Ramaker. And, uh, we, we spoke with our Preservation Commission, Karen Herman is the chair. Uh, we spoke with uh, the Historical Society, the Ballad Gulf Historic District, and we've tried to reach out to as many people as possible to make sure that they're aware of this and to help them understand uh, what process they should use to provide their input. Uh, so earlier, uh, those that arrived early, we started uh, handing out a, a yellow notepad where we'd ask that if you're interested to write down your email address, or if you don't do email, another way to reach you. And what we'd like to do is uh, have that list available so that as new information comes in from Ramaker, from, from, Mass from MBTA, uh, and from InMotion, that we're able to quickly and effectively notify you <coughs> of those uh, new information. Uh, but for the time being, uh, we were given a notice saying that we had 30 days to respond, uh, which would be next week if you, if you took that literally. But in my communications with Ramaker and Associates, they've uh, stated that that deadline is not a hard deadline and that we do have more time. I believe the Preservation Commission is planning to meet in mid-June uh, to discuss this, which is past that deadline, and I believe that they will be able to submit comments after that time. So, uh, to sum it up, uh, many of you live near these proposed sites or, or are concerned with their location. If you, if you have specific concerns that uh, you'd like to submit to Ramaker, uh, we'd be happy to help facilitate that uh, process by if collecting the comments and, and helping assemble them to put them all through. It may be effective if you have comments as part of an association, a neighborhood association, uh, to, to put them together under that uh, group. But this is just meant to be a public notification uh, to make sure you're all aware of it. So John, also just to 
and I know you guys have been working on it, but just to put some color around this, um, this is a company that the MBTA signed up uh, an agreement, it looks like in July of 2014. Um, I found this today that the MBTA signed a 22 year agreement with this company called InMotion to deploy the system meant to improve and expand access to Wi-Fi for commuters using dedicated frequencies. Um, so it just talks that this has been something that the T has talked about for 2014. It sounds like they are going to put, or the plan is for them to put 330 of these monopoles uh, throughout the system, throughout the commuter rail system, um, with about 1.3 miles <coughs> in between each one. It's a line of sight technology, so that's why the uh, uh, the height is, is what it is. Um, so I, I asked today when I, I play some phone calls to the person at the Department of Transportation to see if what flexibility they had and their flexi the flexibility is based on the, uh, the technology, the line of sight. Um, it, it also told us, we were told it was three, <coughs> but I was told there were five. So it sounds like we've got a gap in, in information here as far as where those other ones are. Correct. So is that so, consistent so, with your... So basically, yes. Uh, my understanding is that we were only notified of the three locations because of their proximity to historic districts. Any other proposed polls that are uh, in the project, we have not been notified of formally, although we are aware, we are aware that there are others. Do we, do we know the locations? No. Uh, we're, we're awaiting that information. I know that um, the lead here for the T, Rick Cologne, was unable to make it here tonight. <coughs> it said that he would meet with with the board, with all interested parties. My question is: You mentioned a 30-day window, and the concern that I would have is 30 days is not a lot of time to get them to reschedule a meeting. So, can we get some type <coughs> of relief on that 30 days in writing? I did receive it in writing, uh, but I can with get a specific. In the I can ask for a specific date. Uh, they just said it's not. 30 days is not a hard deadline, but they didn't give a specific time frame, so I'll ask for that. I asked, uh, when I was on the phone with him today, I asked what the, the time frame was, and he said, you know, it's, it's a couple of year project. He also said that the, uh, the Lowell line was going to be the first line to be done. We're on the Haverhill line, so I don't know. I, I couldn't get any information from him as far as timelines on the whole project, which was concerning um, to find out what this is. So um, I don't know how we can make sure we get that because that's that's a key piece of information especially if there's a there's a time date and they're not giving us the outside end of that comment period so did did, did you mention that the pool I, I didn't hear you mention the height the height of the poles there are 74 foot uh monopoles or 70 foot poles but i believe there's some antennas that will extend up to 74 feet as proposed yeah so your, your comment about not a hard deadline really concerns me because legally I would assume it's a we have 30 days to respond and you know in theory they could just ignore any responses that come outside of that 30 day time period. Or they that could act and say there was no opposition. I exactly. So, <laughs> so we that, have already responded uh, from a staff level with questions uh, and comments but I think it would be helpful to compile more and have a more comprehensive list of comments and concerns but and so, so we have to do that within 30 third. days, it would have to be by the 3rd of June, so the 2nd of June. So we really need to push the Conservation Commission, the Balladville Historic <coughs> District Commission, to meet as soon as possible versus take advantage of what seems to be a, you know, a, f a window that I don't really trust. Okay, I mean, I'm awaiting confirmation of that new deadline. I, I could get it any minute, uh, but I, I expect that to be extended beyond 30 days. Yeah, yeah what, what one person says and what legally is, is acceptable. So it sounds like um, we're talking about there's one section because it's got takes federal money in. There's one um, opportunity, according to at least what we're being told, as far as the opportunity to weigh in on that is that is this National Historic Preservation Act, section 106, is the only thing that's called out that's required from the feds, and it talks about what is a historic property. 
and there's uh, there's an out there's a, there's a link to uh, a, a manual and a citizen's guide to uh, I don't know if you've seen this online, but it was that hard to find? I found it today. I think probably people here will see hands shaking, but they're talking about the different aspects of what historic properties included buildings structured sites objects and districts so there's there's a certain specific criteria and it says that the independent federal agency to promote promotes historic preservation oversees the operation of section 106 process and advises the president of congress on historic preservation policy so this is this looks like the only uh, lever that's out there is this right. I guess the question is, before we turn it over, is that there should be a way, I mean, if the town's going to weigh in on it, how do this, what's the best way for the, the residents to weigh in on it? So really the most impact. So I would recommend that uh, residents submit the emails to Ramakar and Associates and copy us so that we have a copy of them, we can continue having a file on it. But, and we can also submit directly uh, from the town. Uh, if you send the comments to us, but the 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 woman the address to send them to is Rose Mer, Rosemary. R O S. Can we can we provide that? Yeah, we, we can put it on the website. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll put it on the website. Put on tomorrow morning. <laughs> we'll put it on the website, right. and all everybody that filled out their email address as well. So let's yeah, we'll send it. We'll send a full list of information. And let's make sure it's if we're on our new website. Let's make sure it's prominently displayed. So if somebody wants is not able to be here tonight, they know where to go to, to get to that point. So. And if we could include links to these documents that Alex uh, yeah. located, yep. uh, that would be ideal as yeah, well. Yeah, there's, there's some good information out there, but it took, you know, took a little while to, um, to, to do some searches on it. So uh, before we turn it over, any other questions from the board? Um, I have a couple questions. Are we relying on this consultant that this National Historic Preservation Act is the only basis upon which we can object? Or do we, like, does town council have any knowledge? I mean, I, it seems like we're assuming that because they're telling us that's the only basis we can object that that's the case. And I'm wondering if we're just taking that on faith. Well, uh, as far as zoning, uh, typically when we have monopole applications, as a matter of fact, we have some pending in front of the Zoning Board of Appeals now, they have a special permit. The private companies. Tom, can you speak up a little bit? We got a little busy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With Town Council, Tom Arbus. With, with regard to, to zoning, uh, whenever a monopole is re requested to be installed in town on private property, we it, there's a you need a special permit on the Telecommunications Act of 1996, uh, and the Board of Appeals hears those applications for special permits. Uh, the building inspector is taking the position because this is being proposed on state property uh, that uh, this project is exempt from Andover zoning. So, according to the building inspector who interprets the zoning bylaw, uh, there is no requirement here for a special permit. Again, because it's not on private property, it's on it's on state property, and that's that's the typical zoning aspect of these kinds of projects that he's saying is not applicable here. But this is strict, <coughs> strictly under 106. Does an abutter have the ability to appeal the building inspector's determination on the application of zoning? Pardon me? Does an abutter to one of these modifiers uh, have the ability? I don't ability? want to give advice to abutters. That's what we all want. Yeah. Does the town of Andover <laughs> own any land that abuts any of this location so that you could give that advice to us? Yes, they do. The property next, I'm at Two Burnham. The, the lot of land next to me is town land, and it's vacant, and it has been for a while. Yeah, and looking at and looking at some of the other communities, some of the other articles from uh, like Concord, uh, they took the same position that it was it was the 106 <coughs> was the only hook, and they said that uh, it wasn't. There was it was exempt didn't have to comply with local zoning and no special permit there were a couple of other towns out there in, in just looking to see some history because there's 60 there's 60 communities involved with this uh, with 330 of these proposed polls so this is uh, that some people have kind of gone through some of the process it looks like because some of this 
started uh, November of 2016. Some of the notifications, like with Concord and some other ones. Um, but it would be, be nice if we had the person here tonight uh, from the MBTA uh, that is the proponent of this to address so all of us. So, okay. Um, anything else from the board before we start? Yeah, yeah. Just, just a question. Yeah. Tom, Tom, you mentioned that our that building inspectors' interpretation of our zoning bylaws don't require, don't give us any authority. Could our zoning bylaws be written in such a way that it could give authority over projects such as this? Or it not sounds as though it sounds as though 106 just not overrides well, everything. Forget 106. The fact that it's on MBTA property, it's state property, and according to him, and I concur with that, that it's exempt from the zoning. So it's exempt under any zoning, any municipality zoning, not just Andover's zoning. Sounds like Concord's taking the same position. Well, that's, what, that's what it said in the article. I haven't talked to anybody in Concord. I was just trying to do some research to see what other towns have done. But uh, that's that's what they said. It's, uh, yeah. Okay, anything else? So, so does, all, does all this mean that they have it by right to be able to do this? It's There's no jurisdiction that we have locally. There's no jurisdiction the state Sounds government like has. And that the only possible opposition that can be raised is under this 106 historical culture. Is that? That's our understanding based on uh, what we've reviewed and what we've learned from other communities. It, it would be interesting to find out if any of those other 330 poles um, are in the areas of, of cultural um, impact or, or historic impact, or if our three are unique amongst the entire project. Um, whether that might provide us with some opportunity for leverage. Yeah, let's see if there's any history. Yeah. Right. Well, if there's any other communities that, that might have had polls in the same situation and what strategies they're employing. And whether they've had any success. Right. Or not. That's right. why that's right. why we need to hear from the proponent here because this is I feel like we're, you know, one hand tied behind our back here without the proponent here tonight. So yeah. it's, it's and, and I can't imagine we're the first community that's going to have concerns about 74-foot towers being put in places that mm -hmm. they didn't exist before. So the question is, is there any precedent for federal legislators getting involved and in trying to figure out options or things that are maybe more acceptable to the community? There's another, there's also, a, separate from this, there's another project called the, uh, it's the, it's a safety project, it's a federal project that requires another network but with regular telephone poles and wired throughout all the uh, tracks in the United States it's a safety it's more of a safety thing than this one uh, when you look it up it, it might look like the PTC is the same but it's it's too uh, it's the positive train control uh, piece but that's a separate network and completely different but when you look it up it can get confusing um, okay uh, anything else? If not, we'll uh, open it up to. Yes. It is one more thing. Do we know when we'll find out where the other two poles are in town? Do we get any? We ex I was expecting to hear back early this week uh, from Mass DOT, the same representative um, Mr. Svoli spoke to. Um, we're actively asking the questions. We're, you know, awaiting responses. Unfortunately. And the fellow. Our uh, local delegation can provide some assistance in removing roadblocks to try and get some of this information. Yeah, we've, been, we've begun the process of engaging them. So, I see Joe Thibodeau here tonight from uh, Central Italian's office. Joe, have you guys engaged in this yet? No. So we had multiple people. Hi, I'm Joe Thibodeau, 73 Carmel Road, and also from Senator Barbara Italian's office. Um, we had multiple people contact our office today. In fact. Some of you might be here tonight. Uh, thank you for the, for the calls and the emails. Uh, so this is an issue, especially with the MBTA being a state agency and the Department of Transportation. This is something that we're also concerned about. And we want to try to be as helpful as we can with this, with, with all of you and with the town. Um, so I'm, I'm in particular here tonight to listen and to learn a little bit more about this and, and hopefully see how we can help out. Yeah, I think you know, the point that was brought up by Dan um, is a good one. That's if we can get some any kind because Concord looks like it's gone through this in some other communities. If we could get any, if we can get any kind of history on any kind of dialogue would be would be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Increase and in yeah. increase in responsiveness would be ideal, so we can yeah. find out what the rest of the impact is to the to 
the end of a community. Yeah, we'd be happy to do that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we'll start. Bob, hit us. Bob? Bob McCumber, 23 Rundle Street. <coughs> uh, we'll be probably the most um, directly affected. We're going to have a um, mobile call on, they say, Havel Street, but it's really not mobile street. <coughs> it will be uh, about 20 to 30 feet from that drive. And uh, so I took a picture of the one on Shepley. It was put in about 15 years ago. It's a 74 foot um, pole about as close to this house as it would be to ours. And this is what it would look like. So just one of them. Almost on top of it. <coughs> so in any event, um, one thing I talked a little bit with John, and it was nice to give you a call this afternoon. And uh, I feel that we've got this 30-day clock running, and we're swimming in our own juice because we don't even know what to do with it. And, uh, and the people that can tell us are not available and showing up and, and communicating. So uh, they, Ramica did send um, a series of nine maps, eight or nine maps that I saw today, Rainmaker, whatever the name is, and uh, they're wrong. Five of them show that this, this tower that we think is going to be near us is across from the street from Mr. Takeout on Haverhill Street, on Emmore Street. So they have the arrow pointed. And then the other four show it's um, near us. So, I mean, we're just totally confused. And so I think we're justified in asking them to start the clock completely from day one because they're confusing us too. We don't know what we should be objecting to because we're not quite sure what they say they want to do. So uh, that's one, one comment I have. And also, if there's under Section 106, there's certain things that probably are successful in winning the argument to have something recited. Um, because a poll, there's, there's really no mitigation you can do for a, a cell poll. I mean, it's, its impact is profound and it's negative. The only mitigation you can do is to cite it in a different place. So um, we've got to know what arguments have won in the past to, to make that happen when you're dealing with a historic district. And we don't know that. So um, we need to find, find that out. Um, I have read online that, that it, an argument that has always failed in court is that cell phones are not safe. Cell phone towers are not safe. It, it's undetermined. So the courts throw it out every time you try to use that to get a cell phone tower sent somewhere else or sighted in a different place. So it has to be a different argument. Um, also, in some of the material I looked at before I came here, which was also sent by a landmaker, um, they, were, they did some kind of a study. They keep using terms that we would know, you know, abbreviations that mean nothing to a person like me and probably most of you either. And they had determined that there was no significant, no impact at all, or more or less, on uh, historic district for what they want to do. <laughs> That's nice in little Wisconsin, you know, I'm sure. Or if it's invisible. Yeah, yeah, right, right. Um, well, it has quite an impact on us and on the neighborhood and the street. And, uh, and, and very much compromises the uh, integrity of the Shawshank Historic District. I mean, if, if, if having a, a district, a historic district, can't protect us from something like this, why even have it? So we got to find a way to make that work and protect us. I'm very glad all of you are here because uh, we, we've got to find a way out of this. But the clock ticking when we're swimming and, and flailing is very unhelpful. And I think it is, would be reasonable for, for them to start it all over again and start giving us maps and, and material that actually makes sense and matches and we're not getting conflicting information. Okay. That makes all the sense in the world. How many people? How many? How many folks want to talk just to show of hands, just so we can? Okay, good. All right, all right. Um, Don Rob. Don Rob, 36 York Street. Um, I'm not going to butter to this, but I have a deep concern for Shawshank Village. Uh, I work with the Historical Society. I do presentations on William Wood and the village and how it happened and what it is. Uh, I have real concerns. My my question first is. Who is the authority in Section 106 that decides whether or not this is in violation of the historical or cultural uh, impact of the other thing? Is that something that, that MBTA says, well, no, it's not, and, and that's that? Clearly, our Zoning Board of Appeals has no control over this. The Board of Selectmen has no control over this. 
So we are at the mercy of META. And therefore, I think the first thing we have to do is ask them for something very specific. All of you people have come tonight with concerns. How much do you know about what's really going to happen there? Nothing other than, other than what has been provided, which is a sort of sketch of this. I would like to see a presentation made to the Board of Selectmen <coughs> in, a, in a place that's large enough to hold everybody in which we get, A, a map that specifically cites where each of these towers would be, and secondly, a photograph of each location as it looks now and what it would look like once that tower went in. And certainly with, with what we have in technology, that's easy enough to do. But I think the MBTA ought to do that for us. Then I think we ought to pursue very carefully uh, with uh, perhaps uh, not just our state representatives, but also uh, Nikki Sangas in terms of the federal uh, impact of this, of this cultural and historical thing. There is, in the United States, no other village like Shawshank Village. Other uh, towns that are built like that are for workers in factories. Shawshank was a neighborhood, and it still is a neighborhood. It's the amazing thing about it. But you can walk around those streets today, and what you are seeing is what William Wood saw you know, back in the 1920s. He didn't see these phones, these towers up there, and I don't think we should either. So that's my comment on the whole thing. Thank you. Well said, Don. Uh, yes, in the back. George Ank here, Bob York Street. I completely agree with what Don said. We need to get more information. I'm here not as a direct abutter, but a concerned abutter who also lives in the Shawshank Village. But I also don't want to leave out Ballard Vale and our neighbors all the way up to Burnham because these polls will be seen very easily by people well outside of even maybe the direct location. According to information I got this morning directly from Ranick or Ramick or whatever they are, um, and Miss Jessica McDonald, uh, they stated in their letter that they expect to have a finding of no significant effect under, um, under their permit process for uh, Section 106, which is unbelievable, based on an historic survey that they said was done by Mr. Let's see, Mr. Dixon of Midwest Archaeological <laughs> Consultants, who is not even in Wisconsin, I believe. I mean, I've worked with other agencies like PAL, who do historic agent, who do historic review. They haven't even had a local review of this project by someone in state who would be knowledgeable of this. This 30-day process, the hot, the clock is ticking. I don't think that they're going to stop that clock, and we've got to be really strong in our voice to them, because according to them, again, June 5th is what she stated is that's their expected deadline. And if we don't get comments into them and somehow address this with Mass Historic Commission, which is the state process, we're going to be lost. So please, and anything you can do with this timeline and through Mass Historic would greatly help. And then the last point I'd like to make is, you know, this, uh, particularly with Ballard Vale, the Ballard Vale section, I haven't looked at the maps, but if the Shawshin River is, if there's a riverfront zone that's within 100 feet or whatever the buffer zone is for the town and talk to the Conservation Commission, under NEPA, they have to make comment and they have to address Wetlands Protection Act. So there is a possibility that there's something they overlooked. Again, I, I implore you, please, on our behalf, to try and do something about this. Well, I think I think we need to work in partnership on this. Yes, because yes. It sounds I mean, like I will certainly make comment yeah. and and I will help people make comment, but it's unbelievable. I think that the lack of notification that they've done through this process is appalling. Not to mention what Bob said about the addresses. They're listing a, a local address as the site of the project. The maps and the plans that Bob referred to, that they can't, even the one in our neighborhood, they've got it listed perhaps on Balmoral side. I've seen it in the design plans, the engineering design plans that you have on the select board agenda. Is actually showing the poll on the Enmore Street side. Nobody from Enmore that I talked to was aware of this project. And if they're abutters, what that's again, they, have they notified anybody? No. They no just the only notification of butters was the notification that we sent out right. based on the fact right. that we that's wanted to have exactly. this conversation so with everyone. All they did was submit notice through the Eagle Tribune. The Eagle Tribune article actually lists five address, two outside. There's a Lawrence address and a North Andover address, and three in Andover. Their clock is ticking, and, so, and they've said it's June 5th, very adamant. Again, in the email to, to me from this morning, she said very clearly they expect a finding of no significant effect, that they're not going to be categorically included for an environmental impact assessment. They said that they did a study based on view sheds, 
Where is that data? Where's Mr. Dixon's report? They haven't provided it to you in the town. That's crazy. So just just the def definition here is that the, um, the Section 106, which is the National Historic Preservation Act, requires federal, federal agencies uh, to consider the effects of federally funded projects on historic properties to afford the Advisory Council of Historic Preservation an opportunity on such projects. So I think this because this is federal money that's coming through, this is the only thing that it's triggered. And it's an independent, uh, it's an independent federal agency that promotes historic preservation. Uh, Don oversees the operation of Section 106 and advises the President and Congress on historic preservation policies. So that's that's who they are. But, uh, right. So I think talking to SHPO is the State Office of Historic Preservation, finding out what our state office can do because they have to consult with SHPO. Mm -hmm. They have to do that as part of the federal process. Question: Is is there federal money here? Is MB because it's MBTA and oh, MBTA sorry. gets some federal money, I'm, I'm, or is it? I mean, is it a federal project that even this applies yes, to? It's not a federal project, but it looks like. I mean, if you were to. I don't, I don't know the answer to that, yeah, but it that, looks that's, like that's another big it looks question. like it, it looks like it's probably funded through f federal dollars somehow if it's <coughs> triggering this. Because when you look at what's triggered, then all I could find is that's what's triggering the federal funds. And again, something we need to yeah. know. Yeah. That and here's right. something: federal funds they, they wouldn't go through the process. They wouldn't go through this process. Okay. And the thing that's interesting is that this was an agreement that was signed by the MBTA in July of 2014. Uh, they signed a 22-year contract with this company called Emotion. So this has been this has been in the planning stages. Other towns have heard about it in 2016. So this is this isn't something that just came up. And this has been something in the plan. Okay. Uh, yes, the lady right there. Hi, Phyllis Zimmerman from Nine Street. Um, I do live in several blocks over, but in the general vicinity of where this would be. Um, my good friend Bob McCumber uh, called me yesterday in <coughs> a terrible state and said, what are we going to do, what are we doing? I said, well, what we're going to do is make sure we get into here tonight, and that's what we did. Um, I want to show you, you've probably seen these before. Many of us have these little plaques which say that 9 Carisburg Street is included in the National Register of Historic Places as part of the Shawshank Historic District, blah, 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 blah. And I want you know that there's also a boulder Back on it that designates our neighborhood as a historic district. I've done not enough homework to know that that is not always dispositive, but it certainly should at least be taken into consideration. I'm absolutely horrified that these people didn't bother to notify us <coughs> until now. This is outrageous and ridiculous. The 30 days is a complete joke, and there's no way that's, I mean, we'll all tie ourselves to the railroad tracks. <laughs> <laughs> right? Right? Yes. <laughs> So something has got to be done. This is, this is a, a tremendous imposition on all of us in our neighborhood. Um, you know, is there any way that the place and placement of these things could be mitigated? I mean, we have a great big industrial complex next to us. Could they put it behind Brickstone Square? Nobody would care if it was over there. Yeah, it's not buildings. Or put it on top of Brickstone Square. <laughs> ah, <laughs> there you go. Line aside. But then we have another blinking light from the FAA. Well, anyway, they, <laughs> we're in the line of sight from Lawrence what, Airport, which what, they haven't. They've said, "Oh, we're not going to put lights on this," but you know, we're going to get a light on it. Yeah, when, when I asked when I asked a question about some of those questions of of this fellow, by the way, um, who was the person that was going to be here and then couldn't make it, this guy Rick Cologne, and he's uh, he's at the Department of Transportation uh, with the state. Um, he, that's when he brought up that it's a line of sight technology. So it's not a cellular like our phones. It's a, it's a line of sight. So it's you know it's point to point. Where that's that's why they're they're talking 1.3 miles apart. So I'm not I'm not I'm not I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not arguing for the technology. I'm just telling you what when I asked that question. Five feet tall. They want to put a 74 four foot tower there. So there's the tower. Yep. Sounds good to me, Bob. And why are we locked into that technology? Exactly. Because they're going to have to the T signed a 22-year agreement in 2014, as best I could find. Another little exception for okay. certain areas. Okay, just to keep it moving, uh, this gentleman right here. Bill Bertles, I'm at 24 Rundle Street. I live across the street from uh, Bob McCumber. 
And I'm curious as to whether DigSafe gets involved in this, because as I recall, when the Hapel Street property was uh, originally a home, I believe there were sewer lines or something that went through there when they turned that into a parking lot. So that should be looked at as far as on the uh, city plans or the town plans as to whether their particular uh, involvement would impact that. Right, because you're going to have to wire these. Yeah. They're going to have to connect these I think Piccadilly Lane also had, uh, I think there was, there were plants for uh, lighting that are there. And there may be underground services there also, which we don't know about, but okay. should be investigated. Okay. Thank you. Um, in the back. Yes, sir. Hi, I'm Dave Chris calling on Dean Murnbrook. I read the um, original proposal for the motion to the MBTA in 2014. Initially, they were proposing just having these uh, stations, these uh, transmitters at stations. They're only going to have 5% um, filling in the empty spots in between. And somewhere between then and now, went from primarily only transmitters at stations to primarily everywhere else. And now that we're learning that there may be other um, uh, modules in it over, it's, I think it's really important to get a sense of the scope because that scope could work. <coughs> uh, if, if there's nothing keeping them from adding more, um, there's certainly an incentive for the MBTA to install more towers because that provides more revenue. Uh, it's included in the proposal. There's also a strong possibility that they would be adding um, a cell capability selling that revenue to, uh, or selling that access to Verizon, at and what have you. So clearly there's a lot of interest in getting a sense of the scope. I think there's an interest, there should be an interest for the town because <coughs> if it's not five towers but more in the future, what's limiting that uh, that growth? Um, it just occurs to me if we're if we're talking about a 1.3 mile distance because of the line of sight, the the two that are suggested for Shawshin and the one for Ballardvale are separated by I'm not quite sure how many miles, but it's more than two cell phone towers in between. I think we need to know a how many and where, and then for this meeting that we've got to have, all of those people need to be notified as well because they don't even have the benefit of being a historic district, you know, to protect them if, if it does at all. Andrew, do we have any, I know that he couldn't make it tonight. He was going to come and then he couldn't make it tonight. Do we have any indication of his commitment, I mean, to come here, to meet with us? We we'll call him every day. So, like John had mentioned, we hope to have a date um, within the next 48 hours or so. Okay. And we'll all be notified. Of and everybody will be notified. I did. I did make him aware of our scheduled meetings for June, which are. I mean, I think. I think we'll meet. I think we'll meet whenever. <coughs> we'll take it out of schedule. time uh, because we'll of this, this impending 30-day. I don't. I, I agree. Yeah, I don't, uh, without with this date that they're throwing on us, yeah, we we've got to can't send, wait. Yeah, we, we've got to send a formal letter back to them about <coughs> this 30-day date and you know town manager letterhead um, requesting um, you know a date after that specific date get that on record versus doing it in email and you know talking to someone that might not have authority and Joe if we can get some help from your yeah. office and then also if we can invoke uh, our other reps as well if we can put the team together on it because we've <coughs> got a lot of time here okay um, go back Hello, Chile, 15 Burnham. I just wanted to encourage you to use us as your resource uh, I can't believe you know, it sounds like you guys knew about this May 3rd I just found out about this yesterday through a neighbor who's not in a butter but happens to know the neighborhood well. Um, there is the newspaper, there's social media, there's lots of ways of getting the word out. Um, please use those, those techniques at your disposal and get as many of us engaged as possible because we're going to keep coming. And the more people who find out about this, we're going to keep knocking on the doors. And, it's, and you know, this is a major, major impact. On my neighborhood, I've lived there almost 14 years. I love my neighbors. Um, and this is this is a major impact. Um, the second thing I wanted to mention is that if all goes poorly, if there's a way to talk to the NPTA about the technology and about the pole itself, I know that there are designs out there that do not have the array bristling and at four feet and a huge. There are sort of single pole designs. Um, is there a way to adjust the height? Is there so do we have any leverage in order to influence 
how that looks if we do end up being stuck with a few of these. Can we at least mitigate that visual impact? Um, that's, a, that's a huge question that I have. Yeah, we'll affect our property. Okay. Yeah. Um, last question for me. Some of these uh, towers also have uh, assigned for them generating stations in case of power failure. <coughs> and that's another thing that should be probably considered, whether those will be attached. And also there's fencing that goes around them. And who maintains that stuff? Okay. Yes, sir. <coughs> Vincent Bradley, 12 Arundel Street. I would just suggest that maybe Mr. Rob could work with the Andover Historical Society and at least send a document that perhaps all of us and our neighbors could sign uh, to meet that June 5th deadline if, if it ends up being a legal issue um, and, and just to have something on record so that we don't go without actually uh, you know, responding in a meaningful way. And I'd also say we're all in this together so if you have five polls it really impacts the entire town and if in three days we can get 60 people out give us two or three weeks and we'll probably get four or five hundred people out and I think we have to work with our elected officials and town managers mm -hmm. I know uh, the senator's office has been helpful with the MBTA issue in the past and that has improved a lot um, and I think we have to follow the same the same format everybody working together so thank you thank you that's a great idea and um, we can work tell Matt your yeah. office will yeah. be the focal point as far as information right mm -hmm. just one of the, and everybody here in case you came in late, we're looking to get a list of everybody's email address if you want to be included. Uh, Maybe in the hallway, it's a yellow pad. Okay. Um, hands. I just want to say the Historical Society will be more than happy to provide some documentation about Shawshank Village and, and its history and cultural value to the town. Good. It's something we can easily do, and I will work with the town manager yeah. on getting some. Don, Don's the right guy for that, that's yep. for sure. Okay. Ted. Uh, Ted Tiger, 5 Duffin Road. Um, this chairman question. Uh, do they really need town approval? I think they can just go and do it anyways. No matter what the residents say, they can just go and say, sorry, we're doing it. It's a real possibility. I defer to Andrew on that. Uh, based on the fact that they would be installed on state land, they would be, they would not be subject to, uh, to town zoning. And so I kind of question the guy really wanted to come here. Because if he really wanted to, why would he want to come here? <laughs> <laughs> you know what? I really these wonderful because if I can still do it anyways, I don't need Andrew's approval. I don't need your approval. We're going to do it. And I had signed on the group for 22 years. I'm coming in. So I guess I question by asking is maybe the board to merely write a letter of their opposition to it, at least write to the state and seek help from the state right away. Because we can do a lot of things yeah. here, but if they can come in anyways, at least like the voice Secretary of Transportation is a minimum. Yeah. But on that note, can I can I just ask, do you where can I find out? Oh, so, I'm sorry, Katie Donovan, Two Burnham Road. <laughs> um, so I'm the location of one of the sites that's in my backyard. Um, how do I find out what the distance of the right of way is? I mean, they they're claiming they're exempt because they can come in on a right of way. Well, any of the research that I've done so far is that the right of way is 80 feet from the center line of the tracks. If that's accurate, that's not enough room to have a train coming through a, a track, a five foot pad, a fence to go around it, and any of the other requirements. So if they're coming in under the right of way argument, that's fine. I understand that there's certain things that we can't do, but according to my deed, I own the property up to the tracks. So if there's a right of way that, ex that gives them the, the, you know, the right to use that property around there, how far does it extend and perhaps that's where some of the argument can come in that these need to be in locations where the train right of way or the you know the right of way is a, is a larger area because I don't know how they're going to get a pole <laughs> of five foot concrete pad and a fence around it if it if it is in fact 80 feet from the center line of the, of the train track. So that's was kind of in the same question. Are they are they are they on? Private property right of way, or is it? Or yes. is it? They say yeah. yes. And these uh, MTA own land. It's, it's right, just of right of way land. It's because I own where they're where they're right. proposing it. I own to the track. But of course, <coughs> I understand that I'm a, I have that area that isn't. It's mine. I own the land, but right. they have the right to use it. Right. And I understand that there's arguments that can be made against that. But my my question is, 
for across the board, where do I find out? I mean, I mean, perhaps I'm wrong. Maybe my right of way isn't 80 feet. Maybe it's you know 250 feet, and then they you know they have room. But in furtherance of that argument, I would say that while they can build in that right of way, there still has to be some level of requirement that they can't build right up to the end of the right of way. I mean, I don't know if if it applies, but that's just I think. If we're going to attack it, everybody doesn't want it in the backyard. I understand that. I also understand the necessity of it and, and you know the benefits that some of this has, but they should be located in the appropriate locations and they should be safe. And if, if that happens to be two Burnham Road and it doesn't have a historic in, impact, I have to live with that. But before we get there, I want to know, you know, are they going to build this right up to my to the end of that right of way? And you know, does my 12 year old that goes and plays in the backyard, is he going to be safe to for climbing, not for, we're not going to get into the electromagnetic that we're all going to have to agree to disagree. They say it's safe, we say it isn't. We don't want to live under it, but again, it is what it is. But, you know, can, can the kids climb on these? Can they, who's maintaining it? How is it protected? How is the area up to where they claim they have the right to? How much of that area can they really use? <coughs> okay, yes, sir. Hi, uh, Justin Best, Foley, 14 Argyle Street. So, I guess to the town manager. There's been a few towns that they've done this to, and there's more in the future. So have we talked to all these towns, and are we greater in numbers than just Andover? You know, do we start looking at other towns, this is going to affect in the future, start talking to them now, to come together as a larger Massachusetts versus the MPTA versus Ooh. just Andover? We started, and we'll continue to do so, because there are some who have gone through it, and there are some that don't know it's coming, exactly. much like we did. You know, we um, so so like that, that. That, that's something we're working through, absolutely. And there's 60 communities, so... Right. Well. Okay. <laughs> the guy with the biggest voice in the room, Don Ron. <laughs> I have an off the wall question. I think everybody here is assuming that if these go up, it will reduce property values. Yes. Do we agree on that? Yep. Then yeah. my question is according to the Bill of Rights, there's a, it's called the taking clause in the Constitution. And that says that if a government agency takes property, it needs to uh, pay for that property uh, to the person from whom it takes it. So in a sense, if the state is building this, they are taking part of your property, which is the value in the house that you own. I don't know whether that will fly or not. I don't, don't give an opinion on it, Tom, but it's an interesting question that I think we should throw at them. I think what I will tell you, Mr. Hub, is that there's a series of both the United States Supreme Court and Massachusetts Supreme Court cases that say in order to be successful in a, this is called a regulatory taking, if you will, <coughs> that you would have to you lose all, not some, but all economically viable use of your property. And that would be the argument that, that's the argument that they would make to you that in order to uh, succeed in a taking case, uh, that all of your value of your property uh, would have to be wiped out. I think that's what they would tell you. Okay. <coughs> Sir, in the back. I haven't spoken yet, right? No, no. Um, Daniel Tool, 19 and more street. So first of all, thank you to everybody. You know, we, we didn't find out about this until three hours ago. So the response seeing this, imagine if more people knew. Yeah, so for me, it's a, it's a big issue as seen by what I'm seeing here. I, I think what I'm, sh I have a lot of questions and maybe some of it because I'm in the back room could be here. So the first question is, you know, I've been reading up on the monopoles as what I could for in three hours, but there's a huge range of health ranges in terms of what people say is safe or not safe, but also there's a huge range of options. So when I look at where someone brought up the fact that, you know, we call it Haverhill Street, but on the maps it looks like Enmore, but then later on it looks like Haverhill, and it is bouncing around. So it's clear that someone's just, ah, somewhere over there. They, they're clearly not looking that closely at it. When I went through the maps and a few other things, first off, there's plenty other opportunities that I, I read up in Concord, they were talking about an average of 1.5 miles. So first off, the poles in the Shawshank area are half a mile away. It, it doesn't make sense in terms of, you know, my hope would be there's, this is probably coming through in some form or fashion. 
But how it's done and what the needs are of the MBTA is what I would expect it to work to. So clearly, yes, they can be 1.3, but if it's an average of 1.3, clearly there's a range of higher than two and probably less than that. So my thought would be, hey, we understand something has to go through. We would expect to work with that, avoiding historic districts, avoiding other situations, and that's what I would want to see from it, is that the numbers don't make sense and the literature doesn't make sense. Clearly it can be longer than it is. Clearly it doesn't have to be so intrusive. Clearly it doesn't need to be in someone's backyard. There there's, it has to be some play. And even looking at my simple maps, it looks like there's a huge range of opportunities they could place for another half mile that no house is near. And for some dumb reason, they don't want to put it there. I don't know why. Maybe it's harder to build on. Well, too bad. Figure it out. Like, that's, that's my thought. Um, secondly, if you take the health part, oh, I got more. No. <laughs> if, you, if you take the health argument, so I, I found six studies of within 200 meters serious cancer increases. In one case in Denmark, they put a tower on a building. Everybody in the top two floors got cancer. So clearly wow. it can cause cancer in some cases. Maybe not everybody. Um, I have friends who are doctors. Everybody's constitution is different. Maybe some people are more or less susceptible. It doesn't matter. My point is the value argument can stand for people who are right next to the tower. If I think I'm going to get cancer, I've just lost all value to this house. You owe me. So I think there has to be some range that says, hey, you want to put a tower here right next to my house? Well, would you buy my house? <laughs> <laughs> it's not all use to me if I think I'm all going to get cancer. And there's a serious amount of argument. I'm sure we can pull together medical people who will say, this has lost value. We're all going to die. We stay in this house in 20 years. So that's an argument there. Um, all have to die. Just not, not, not <laughs> <laughs> uh, So, and then um, Switzerland and well, Italy. Well, hold on. What, I think town council just wants to. I don't mean to burst your bubble. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm on a roll here, so you should read it. <laughs> but under the Federal Telecommunications Act of 1996, <clears throat> that if a facility um, meets FCC regulations, uh, then you can't argue that uh, the facility is a health risk. Uh, that argument has has been made many a time. And so you're right. The United States has the worst offensive range on these towers in the world. Yep. So they're at a thousand meters, I think, and China's standard is uh, excuse me, a thousand in terms of their outputs will allow a thousand, and China, Switzerland, Italy are at like ten. So literally, I would argue, countries far behind where we are are expecting radiation outputs one the size that America is allowing. So and that's a, very, a, a very valid argument to make to the United States Congress, which has passed the Telecommunications Act of 1996. I leave that to you gentlemen to reach out to our representatives and say, <laughs> this is bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> um, so again, I'm looking for flexibility. Well, you I'm know, I, I, asked, that yeah, I, I asked that question today when I spoke to uh, uh, Mr. Colon, and I said, what is the flexibility that you have? And his statement to me is there is some flexibility. He didn't define it, but he also <coughs> raised the issue of this whole line of sight issue. So you know, maybe there is. I, I don't know. That That's exactly, I asked the same question. That's the so answer so I got Mr. back. Is Mr. Colon the in motion person or MBTA? He's the MBTA, MBTA person. Because okay. in He's motion the is the one who's actually look seeking yeah, to M put the poles up. Right. On. And they've got a, they, they were granted a nationwide license from the FCC for this technology back in, uh, I think, 2014 or so. But yeah. Right, so they're driving the process. It's not necessarily the MBTA. No, but the MBTA is the one that's contracting and yeah. awarded okay. the 22-year-old, 22-year okay. 22 okay. contract to Emotion to do this. So that's their contractor and their partner, I guess you could do the business partner. So anyway, he was the contact that we were given, and he was the person that was supposed to be here tonight and through scheduling couldn't be here. So let's go through and get everybody who hasn't spoken yet that wants to speak, and then we'll come back around. Start okay, <laughs> young lady, go ahead. Um, I, again, from the Simon and Nine Cares Retreat, I would like to see what we can do about having these people show up 
the next time we have a meeting so we can discuss this with them and so that they can hear all of our voices <coughs> and see the faces of people that they're going to be I think we're exactly the same <laughs> spot and I think it's a top priority I, the town manager, assistant town manager to, to make that happen, to make sure that that happens because yep. this is, as I say, we're sitting here with one hand tied behind our back here, right? And that's what I feel like in this conversation, just us trying to figure it out. It sounds like a lot of people have done a lot of good work here, research. A few of us have. Thank you very much. Bob. I don't want to argue for more polls because I don't want any. But um, I wonder, um, maybe if you added, so you're looking at the sequence, and 1.3 miles um, is the next one. But maybe that's right in the middle of a neighborhood. So maybe you add, it, you add a pole and put, I'm thinking like in the back of Brickstone Square. Yep. There's there's nobody on either side of the track there. There's nobody. By the old railroad there. station you the mean, back there. Behind, behind the old their station. garage. Yeah. Behind the oh, garage. The, the parking yeah. garage, yeah. Way in the back. There's nothing there. They don't use it for parking. There's absolutely nothing. They have piles of uh, leaves and bark mulch and stuff like that. And then on the other side, it's Denmark Park, and there's no, nobody there either. And just every phone to be. Well, maybe you put one there so that the next one doesn't have to be in my backyard. Maybe it can be a little bit further down or a little bit further forward. Or maybe what we're talking about to Burnham Road, if you went another three or 400 feet, rather than put it behind your house, you'll be behind that woods, that long stretch of woods. Which I think is town land. Yeah, yeah, which you have no nobody on either side and never will either. You've got but I think it's wet there. So I think that there is a wetland so already. Becomes a wetland issue. Well, if I there's tracks there, then they've got. But there's tracks. Got, they I know there's tracks there. Right. I think there's a different guideline before you can start erecting the towers in the air. There's a NEPA issue that, because I know it. I mean, I've lived in this house for 44 years, so um, I'm familiar with <coughs> the neighborhood and whatnot. And I think that at one point somebody wanted to build in there, and they couldn't because it, it's wet. I mean, it's definitely wet over there. But I, I mean, I don't know. I, believe me, I'd much rather have it. You know, and it does go down there. In fairness, it, it dips down. So, will the impact, the visual impact, be less there than say where well, you it has are? To be the same. It would have to be taller to be that. No, it that doesn't, because it's going line of sight along the tracks. So, I, I don't believe that's accurate. I think it would still be the, the 70 some odd feet. And my impact, even though it's literally in my backyard, I think is going to be less than yours because I have a dip. Right. I just don't. I mean. Uh, nobody wants it in the backyard, but it literally, can you put it on the other side of the track so it's not on to Burn Road is, is part of my question along with the building. But so I should turn a, a hose on the dead end and make myself a <laughs> 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 I think, I think, I think <laughs> the wetland is a historic issue or two. Waterfront really property. Yeah. So I just think when you, when you hit like the end of a line, pick a place that you can put one that has no impact and then go from there and see if you can get another place even if you end up with one more pole, if they're all in place and so don't have any impacts, we're kind of a win-win. Sure. That comes under the, the whole flexibility option. Mm -hmm. yeah. we, we need to talk with them or their engineers. Yeah. Um, any Anybody else? Go ahead. Sure. Um, I had a question about, this is the right-of-way issue. So they've got a right-of-way. Essentially, they're coming in and putting in a facility, a structure, that eventually they're probably, and actually if you look at the case of Rockport, have admitted publicly that they're going to turn around and sell a commodity out of. So I'm frustrated as a homeowner to see this happen to my neighbors and friends where essentially why is this any different than them building some platform for the train to get takeout coffee and then turn around and sell it as a Dunkin Donuts. It doesn't seem any different to me. So is there anything with regard to right of way that allows us or enables us to say, no, wait a minute, the service and the the, 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 the thing that you are putting in is not consistent <coughs> or correct in this process and give us some protection. Because this just seems crazy to me that we're, our hands are tied, that we can't stop the MBTA and this company in motion from coming in, building the structure and facility to turn around and sell a service at our expense. Well, it even says here in, the, in this 2014 article um, that they're going to provide it and then there's going to be an upgrade cost if you want a premium level. So if you're riding a train, Okay. You know what? I ride that train. They've got a lot of other issues to fix. <laughs> 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 it's like, 
get the safe safe tracks and stop people from dying. I mean, really. The, uh, anyway, I'm sorry. Anyway, they'll play. <laughs> so the choir. Your point is well taken because in here they talk about in motion's bigger ambitions for mobile advertising it moves to install its network. So, so the point is is this that there's some kind of there's some kind of business relationship and I don't know if it's a cost sharing or maybe that's how they're absorbing the cost, but the point is well taken. Right. Federal money, state property, and suddenly there's a business model so, here. And, and this is an agreement that they signed for twenty two yes. years in two thousand fourteen. Okay. So, so Dan. Um, logistically would it be advisable for us to try to put a placeholder meeting out there for Thursday in the event that it's possible that um, we could get a representative here as we have a 48-hour posting notice? So if we were to put out a, uh, a meeting for Thursday evening, let's just say, you know, if you guys hear back from someone from the MBTA and they say, gee, yeah, we can come on Wednesday or Thursday, we don't have a publicly posted meeting, it's a little hard for us at least to call a meeting, you still can have a community meeting and it not be a board of selectmen meeting. So logistically, how should we handle that? We can certainly, if there's the availability of the board, hold the date. Um, but I'm hopeful tomorrow we'll have a better indication of what they're... Uh, so how do, you, uh, how do we message we really that? How do we communicate that best to the community? So we, we're going to have the list of everybody in the room, and we will establish a distribution list first thing tomorrow. So everybody here... Um, <coughs> That's only the people in the room. Mm -hmm. so this is really important that we start posting ev all communications on the website so that these folks can tell everyone else who wasn't here to go to the website yeah. so that then they can subscribe. We'll have an informational page right on the website. So yeah. So any updates can be posted there, including the transmittal I provided to the board. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, just, just in general, I, I, I just don't, I don't want to assume anything in this transaction. I mean, we're getting a 30-day notice from a consultant being paid by a private sector vendor who stands to profit from this mm -hmm. contract with the MBTA. I, I think we, I, I don't want us to take anything as, as, uh, uh, as stated. We ought to be challenging all this. All of this seems to be happening very quickly without sufficient input from the public. And I just want us to make sure that we're, if necessary, responding, putting in placeholders, give the community time to evaluate this. You know, I mean, I heard one gentleman up here talk about a 2014 agre agreement signed by the MBTA that didn't even contemplate 74 foot poles. At what point did that change? Was that change with the proper authority? We ought to be challenging that or at least vetting that and not just assume that they have a right to do all this. I mean, I, I just, I get concerned when this stuff comes in and all of a sudden 30 day notice just happens to coincide right after our town meeting and now we're expected to have a comprehensive response in, in short order. It, it just doesn't it just doesn't make sense to me that we're doing this. The other you know quite I mean there's more questions coming up here than I ever imagined. Uh, uh, is it the federal money that is tying our hands in terms of having any local control and authority over this? Do we know whether it's that federal funding? So it's our understanding that the federal funding aspect in exactly what that means with relation to this project is unclear to us is the only thing that tr triggers the 106 process. Right. So, so notwithstanding federal money, um, they would be able to proceed without pretty much any process. Oh, okay. I, I, and and again, I don't want to take anything for granted here. You mm -hmm. know, if we're, if it's a matter of rejecting the federal money to free our hands and to be able to work with the MBTA in a more constructive fashion to find alternative, you know, mitigation here, I just, I just don't want us to assume we have a 30-day window, let's respond to that and not question any of it. I, I want us to question every aspect of this. <coughs> I mean, part of me wants to say, you know, use the avenues available to you to reach out to even this independent federal organization and express your discontent with this process even. You know, this is, this is ridiculous. I'm sure, you know, if you rally people, that certainly could happen very easily. And from a timing point of view, the um, the historic, uh, you know, the, the committees in town, we certainly want to hear from them and we'll need the information, but should we be putting, as, a, as from the town, putting in a placeholder objection uh, to this well before, the, assuming that 30-day window, they may be telling us, yeah, you can, we can waive it and you find out later, no, sorry, you missed the 30-day window. I think window. we should as a board. Right. Yeah, we we should. We'll draft the letter. I yeah. think we should draft it right and away. incorporate and show the objections yeah. we have on historical cultural grounds, the only grounds we can oppose at this point, get that on record well before the 30-day window expires on June 5th, 
uh, and then explore all these other options as soon as possible. I'm also concerned that we're relying on the vendor or whoever that clearly it's their business benefit to do this to say that the only defense we have to this is the historical significance. That, that was my point earlier. Why, so why are we relying upon a right. vendor to the private? It seems to me that may be a legal analysis as well. Um, that you know, it talks about in this citizen's uh, book about uh, the historic preservation that when you have federal funds, then you can raise this issue. And that's great. And if we can be successful on it, fabulous. But there may be other avenues that it seems to me that in motion or whoever isn't necessarily going to point out. They well, don't want us to be successful in opposing them. Well, no. <laughs> no. And the NBTA, quite frankly, this is their deal. They signed this contract. We need to hold them accountable to say, this is the impact you're having in our communities, and you need to answer for that. So we, we can't allow this to go any further without the MBTA answering for this. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Mary Ellen MacGyver, Three on the Street. And quite honestly, we've had enough of the railroad shoved down our throats in our neighborhoods. And I think that's just not fair to keep doing it to the same people over and over again without regard. So I would just ask that you really work hard on our behalf and to make help, you know, let us help you guys to to, to fight this battle because it's not right to, to keep doing the same thing. We've got two tracks, now we get speed trains, we've got people waiting, we got you know, it's just it's one it feels like it's it, it's us against the railroad right now and you know. We didn't buy in this town and fight the railroad. This will be our priority. And okay. uh, it has to be. And we have theirs double the priority right now. Based on everything we've heard today, well, we, this, uh, is, this is the top of the list. Tomorrow morning, we'll, we'll get okay. Uh, I saw some other hands. We can all send in our yeah. own. I was yeah. going to say. Yeah. It's fabulous to have, of course, the, the select board behind us and you know the town of Andover letterhead yeah. and whatnot. But I mean, there's what, 75 people here? We can send in 76 letters, one from uh, the town and 75 from all of us. I think. I mean, the more the merrier. And the question is, where do those go? Because if yeah. they go to Ramaka, Ramaka is a consultant being paid by in motion. So no, that's, that's, that's what I was referring to that independent, there's a yeah. independent right to these federal organizations. Yeah. I, I would like to recommend that if we can get a comment from, from our Historic Preservation Committee, um, because this is in a process under Section 106, my understanding is that letters basically have to, to state the objection within that context and we need to be demanding of them a next step in the process. They think they don't need to do an environmental assessment. Well, you know what? Our next step is we object to the project. You need to do an environmental assessment and show us your alternatives. Because if they don't do an EA, they're not going to do an alternatives analysis and show us all the other information. I, I also question if, if, if we did our own historical analysis to rebut theirs. I mean, so they have one. If there's also one produced, I understand that perhaps it's outside of you know purview of any type of zoning. But certainly, you know, hire counsel and file for an injunction and say to the judge, the federal judge, look, judge, we've got two analysis here: one from the one that stands to benefit, and the other from you know a local community person that does these type of analysis. Perhaps having a rebuttal one to help. I, I, I'm not. I don't know. I'm just. I, mean, I think it, it, again, it, we got to figure it out. What in in what context do these letters need? letters need to be made and what is the specific action item that we're either objecting to and or requesting them to do to be most effective and again the, the permit process is for us as lay people is just not clear Andrew can we get that on our website about the whole process about yep. where people would write to so we'll have a project page for this project and mm -hmm. in, in, on that page we'll the information on exactly how to submit comments okay. and then we'll have the email list that we're working on based on your handwriting tonight and we'll allow other people to add their names to it through the website that aren't, that aren't here tonight and we'll have it up tomorrow okay all right okay a couple of other uh, cans just going back to the historical preservation societies <coughs> is there anything in our town any expert on this that knows anything has there been anything discussed about hey here's an I got you like height for example, like you have to keep within the minimum desk height of the buildings in the area, in the historical area. Do we have any experts that we've been consulting at this point? <laughs> from a zoning perspective? From a, yeah, from a, hey, here's, here's a Shashi historical, and there's all these things that you can't do in this part of town because these are the laws, and these are the historic districts. Is, anybody, is there any expert there, or are we all just kind of throwing things out there? The commission is uh, very well aware of what's restricting, what's allowed, and we've engaged them. So, so do we have any I got yous that we, we, we think of? <laughs> we don't want to let our hand. <laughs> <in. laughs> okay, I got you. Not, not okay. I saw another hand up, I think. Someone that hasn't spoken yet? Yes. Um, I just 
name? I'm Eric Baldwin, 18 Burnham Road. And I just think it's, I don't know, when we're arguing against this, not to start with, you know, we don't want it this high or, you know, start giving that option to them right away. It should be, you know, we just don't want Negotiating it. against ourselves. Right? Yeah. In the back. Jonathan Williams, 20, Aroma Street. Um, I'd, also, I'd also like to say there are alternatives to uh, broadband using um, the towers that are a mile away. And that's the new technologies are shorter range, higher bandwidth, that um, can be placed along the track. Um, that's That every train is within two feet of the track. So you can get way more broadband. Along, along the track than having old-fashioned cell towers. Can, can we get a copy of the contract? What's that? <coughs> Between the MBTA and InMotion. Can we get a copy of that contract published on the website so we can start taking a look at what this entails and what options the MBTA might have in their own? Okay. Um, just anyone else? I want to make sure everybody gets a chance to, to be heard. There is a definition of uh, what is an adverse effect. Yeah, that's what I was uh, thinking about. The, uh, yeah, I, was, I was thinking about as you're writing your emails to whomever you're writing it to, um, as we'll learn tomorrow. Section 106, <coughs> this, this document, which hopefully that will be up on the list, it defines what is an adverse effect. And you know, I'll just read through this one brief paragraph. An adverse effect occurs when a project may directly or indirectly diminish the integrity of a historic property by altering any of the characteristics that qualify that property for National <coughs> Register inclusion. Specifically, if the project diminishes the integrity of a property's location, design, settings, materials, workmanship, feeling, and association, then there is an adverse effect. Examples of adverse effect include physical destruction or damage, alteration inconsistent with the Secretary of Interior standards for the treatment of historic properties, and there's a link there, relocation of the property, change in the character of the property's use or setting, Introduction of incompatible, incompatible visual, atmospheric, or audible elements might go to uh, generators, that type of thing. Um, neglect or deterioration, transfer, lease, or sale out of federal control without adequate preservation restrictions. So there's a lot there that, that, that you can comment on specific to how it impacts you and you personally. I think that's very important. It's very important for us to send an objection, but very important for you personally to comment, in my opinion, on on how this project is adversely <coughs> affecting you, your family, and your community. And if we could have the, the link to this, this yeah. is a this is a uh, frequently asked questions document. Put it on the project page. Yeah, if you can put links to that so that people can <coughs> read that, and uh, it's a great point. You can reflect on those. Okay. Uh, anyone else? Anybody else from the board? So obviously, top priority, town manager and his, his team. And, uh, a round of applause for these <laughs> Thank you for coming out tonight. Uh, Thank you. We'll be back. <laughs> so will we. <laughs>